morning, church. We are so glad you're with us uh, this morning. Can I say this is unprecedented? Um, as I am sitting here preaching, standing rather, preaching and, and talking to you this morning uh, in your home or wherever you're located, this is unprecedented in, in a number of ways. One, we're only one week away from Easter. Here we are on the 5th. So as the Bible timeline, if you will, goes, we're about to see the time when Jesus does the triumphal entry. As you know, we're, we're, as we're looking at the timeline of things, he's, he's coming into town. Uh, just last Sunday, we kind of went through the, uh, the Lord's Supper. We're going to refer back to that. So, uh, by the way, grab your Bible, grab your notes, grab what you need to sort of prepare to help walk through this, um, this experience this morning. But this is unprecedented. As I'm walking through this and, and looking at what's about to happen, we're one week away from Easter, and we're really one week away from not being able to physically gather for Easter. Think about that. I don't know, not in my lifetime, not in my father's, my grandfather's. I'm not even sure how far back that the church has not been able to gather physically for Easter. So I want you to think about that for just a moment, what what you and I are about to experience. But again, we're so thankful for this. And yet when I think about what we're about to go through, pause for just a moment. You and I know what it's like to experience an Easter. The disciples did not. The disciples didn't know what to experience. The disciples didn't know there was going to be a resurrection. They weren't expecting a resurrection. They were expecting the fanfare that they were going to experience when, when they go through Palm Sunday. They were hoping that Christ would be this, this king that comes in and establishes a reign and a rule. Three times he's already foretold of his death, and we know from listening that the Bible tells us they didn't know what to expect. They, they didn't know what to expect. They, they didn't understand the words that were being said. And so here's what we know about this, this Easter experience. They're not a, able to experience what, we, what you and I are. But yet, I think it's caused me to sort of pause and almost put myself in their position, their shoes. For you and I, we're used to gathering because of an empty tomb. They had not yet experienced that. For them, their world was getting smaller and tighter and more restricted. Does that kind of sound like where you and I are? Over the last few weeks and even days, right, just hours, we're, we're getting announcements of, of further restrictions and what businesses can and cannot do, what we can and cannot do when we gather. The disciples don't really necessarily have that official announcement, but yet they're being told that the circle's getting tighter. Here's what we know. The closer that Jesus came to the cross, the more people left him. The closer that he came to the cross in all of these events, which we're going to look at this morning, the garden prayer, the crowds left him. As a matter of fact, his own disciples couldn't even stay awake in this time of prayer and what he was about to experience because we learned last Sunday they truly didn't fully understand what was taking place. And so maybe we're kind of like them today. We don't know what it's like to experience an Easter when we're not gathered together. They had never gathered together for an Easter and so with that in mind, I want to look at this sermon this morning. It's, it's entitled The Garden Prayer. It's found in Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 42, primarily where we're, where we're going to be dialed in at. We're going to go back to uh, Luke chapter 20 as well in, in almost those same verses. So I'm kind of glad that uh, we did what we did last Sunday. That was intentional and on, by design to be leading up to this moment in the cross. But we're looking at this, this topic, the garden prayer. Now, I've been there. It's one of my favorite spots in Israel just outside of the, the city walls of Jerusalem um, to the east is, is a limestone ridge that runs about a mile in length. Um, it, it's, it's called the Mount of Olives. We know that it's, it's a place where Jesus is going to return. He tells us that. It's where the dead in Christ will rise first. As a matter of fact, it's one of those interesting things when you go there, there's actually Christian burial places around the Mount of Olives because people want to be the first in line. <laughs> they they want to be like one of the very first ones to rise. But just down from that, from the west, so we're up on the east of Jerusalem, on the west bank side of the Mount of Olives is a garden. You and I know it as the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a garden where these olive trees exist. And when you go there, they'll tell you that there's, there's four or five trees that date back possibly to the time of Christ. There are these olive trees that the disciples could have, one, either fell asleep around or maybe even Jesus knelt and prayed there. The Bible tells us, we're going to read in just a moment, that a stone's throw away, he went to pray. So, I mean, we're, we're in that area. When you go to Israel, you're within that area. You're on that ground where Jesus prays out this prayer. 
And what's interesting is in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's an olive press because the word Gethsemane literally means olive press. So as Jesus was was praying and as he was sweating drops of blood, he literally was being pressed by the requirements, by the call, by the demand of the Father for a price to be paid for the high cost of sin. And Jesus, in this garden known as Gethsemane, an olive press, everything about him physically and spiritually, 100% man and 100% God, is being absolutely pressed out of him. And so we've just come from the Lord's Supper table. Jesus has entered into Jerusalem, somewhat of a fanfare, but now the crowds have disseminated around him. It's just he and the disciples. He said, you'll find a man and you'll see us in a room. Go up there and we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And once again, he foretells his death. And he even says that one of you sitting close to me will betray me. And they're wondering like who and they're, 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 they're carrying on about who's that going to be. And most of them, I think, probably have an idea of that. And so they finished the Lord's Supper, and here's what we know. The disciples disperse and follow Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane. So we're on a Thursday night. So if you're looking at in terms of a week, here we are on Sunday the 5th. If you'll kind of fast forward to Thursday night, that this is about where we are. We're just days away, moments away from, from the, uh, the arrest. So Jesus is now in the garden, and when he finishes the prayer, you know, Judas now comes with the soldiers, and he's identified, and he's escorted, and he's, he's taken away to imprisonment, and he's falsely accused, and there begins the process. This is where we are. This is where we are. We've left the Lord's Supper table where he said, now hang on, you've got to stay with me on this. He's left the Lord's Supper table where he said, take this bread, break it, it's my body. But then he says this, take this cup. You need to hang on to that. Because he's visually already setting the disciples up for the cross and for a covenant. He says those words, but they still don't understand what this cup means. And I want to show you this cup that was taken, that was passed, that establishes this new covenant that we have in Christ. It's a beautiful story, and I want to unfold it for you. So in Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 42, here's what we read. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Did you hear that? Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him, I'm I'm, going to read on, stay with me on this. If you have your Bibles, just follow me along. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Here it is. And here's a statement on the garden prayer. Father, if you are willing, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Let's let's talk about that this morning. What, What was that cup that he was talking about? So we've left the Lord's Supper. We know the one cup. It's the cup of covenant. It's the cup of sacrifice. It's it's this, this covenant that's in his blood. But now he's talking literally, if you will, figuratively will, about a cup that he's holding in his hand in his life that he knows he's about to bear. The disciples don't have a clue what's taking place. They're just following him to the garden. All they know is once again it's been announced the third time he's foretold that he's going to die. They still don't understand this. They don't know why they're sort of going to this garden now to pray. They have no idea the events that are about to happen next. Again, does that not sound like you and I? Almost hour by hour, day by day, we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know how restricted we are. And yet, in some ways, I think maybe this is good for the church to maybe not be able to gather for Easter for for the first time in a long time. I say that, right? But listen, I think it's good for the church because now we're understanding how important church community is. Because just days after Christ is is, is seen and he appeared to over, over 500, this is when the church began And so I think you and I need a fresh perspective of what it means to be brought to this moment of misunderstanding, of not not fully understanding the value of church and the place of church in life, the place of Christ in our life. But I think now Easter is going to have such a different message to you and I that when we're not able to gather right now for Easter, what a day that's going to be when we are able to gather. We're almost going to experience it just like the early church experienced it. The crowds got smaller. I mean, we've literally watched, we literally watched the crowds go down from 250 to 50 to now 10. The crowds around Jesus numbered in the thousands and in the hundreds and and then in the the double digits and and now it's around 12 and now it's really only around three. We're literally watching this sort of this um, social distancing happen around Christ. 
we're viewing this, and, and, but they don't know there's an Easter coming. They didn't call it Easter. They were sorrowful. You hear that? They were praying because of sorrow. Their heart didn't understand what was about to happen. But listen, Jesus did. So he had to take the cup. What is this cup? This cup represented sin. And I want to show you that. Follow along in my notes. That This cup held, number one, the filth of sin. This cup held the filth of sin. Listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I think it's over here on our screen. Watch this. For our sake, he made him, he made him Christ, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What is this cup that Christ is referring to? It's the cup of sin. Now hang on just a moment. We're going to get heavy right now here for just a moment. You and I have looked down in cups before, and if they were dirty, if they didn't look clean, we wouldn't take it. Hang on for just a moment. What was in this cup? Well, your sin, my sin. You see, often we sort of dismiss sin. We think we're not as bad as somebody else. We think, well, I'm not a murderer, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not this or I'm not that, I'm not as bad as this guy, I'm not as bad as that guy, or not as bad as that girl. But hang on just a moment. What was in that cup? Pornography, immorality, lying, cheating, stealing, murdering. What, what was in that cup? All the detestable sins. Your sin was in that cup. Like, literally, if we could take out the sins of our body, if we could write them down, if you will, and, and, and say, what are the sins in your life, and write them down and place them in a cup. My sin, your sin, the sin of all the world, the sin of all time was placed in that cup. And at that moment, that is exactly what Christ is feeling. You know, it's, it's one thing to apologize for what you've done wrong. It's another thing to take on everybody else's sins. It's one thing to kind of have to admit, yeah, I kind of lied. Yeah, well, not really a lie, but a half-truth. Yeah, there was something inappropriate on my computer. Yeah, I kind of took some things from work that I shouldn't have. Right? It's, it's one thing for us to sort of pony up and, and own our mistakes, our sins, and those, those things that we've done. But it's another thing to say, now, while you're on that roll, I need you to confess everybody else's sins and take the punishment of all your coworkers, of all your, all your neighborhood, of all your county, of all your state. Now that you're on a roll and confessing, guess what? Everybody else's sins are going to be placed on you. And it's you have to pay the price for everybody else's sins. What's in that cup? The sin of the whole world. The sin's past, the sin's present, the sin's future. What do you do with this cup? Jesus said, put your sin in this cup. Stop. Jesus said, take your sin and put your sin in this cup because I'm about to take that on me. I'm about to pay the price for that. No wonder he felt heavy. No wonder he didn't want to go to the garden. No wonder he prayed, Lord, if it be your will, take this cup from me. Can you imagine the weight of not just your sin, but the weight of everybody's sin? You see, what was in this cup? The filth, absolute filth of sin. Isaiah 53, 12 says this, Because he poured out his soul to death, now watch this, and was numbered among the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many. The Savior of the world was now listed among those who are some of the biggest sinners in the world. Literally, this, this man, Christ, that we held as our Savior, now is listed among those who are the transgressors. The Bible says he had to take upon him the absolute filth of that sin. When I first started preaching, and I mean, it's somewhat, it's still popular now. When I first started preaching, we, we did a lot of um, skits. Uh, so I traveled about 33 times a year um, with a group from college. And as the preacher, you picked those who were going to be over the skit, those who were over games, and those who were over worship. And we would contact churches, or con our churches would contact our college, and and we would pick where, sort of where we wanted to go based upon their needs. And most churches wanted you to come in and do something on, on Friday night with their students. And like a lock-in and something on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night. And then stay and preach Sunday morning. So we would literally go in and do like a youth and children like a weekend. And then we would preach to the church on Saturday night. And then we would preach to the church on Sunday morning. Inevitably, we always did a skit. And one of those skits we, we, we always acted out. We acted out like this, there was a businessman in the room, and he walked into his office, and he, he was a Christian, and Jesus was like a literal person like following this businessman, a, a, an, an actor dressed up like Christ. 
And before this, this businessman walked into certain environments, he would literally tell Jesus, can you stay outside? I, I need to make some decisions that you probably won't agree with. We would follow him after work, and he would go into like a, a place, a, a nightclub afterwards, and he would say, it's been a stressful day, Jesus. Can you just stay out inside the parking lot? Let me just go inside this nightclub and just sort of de-stress. Can, can you do that? Listen, every sin that you and I have ever committed, every sin, you and I haven't been able to like say, hey, Jesus, can you turn your back for a moment while I do something? Can you put your fingers in your ears while I lie? Can you, can you not look at this for a moment? Every sin that you and I have absolutely ever committed, every bit of that now, Jesus is Name is attached to it. Every time you've looked at the computer, every time that you've lied, every time you've stole, cheated, every, every act that you and I and the whole world has ever done, the filthiest filth of all the filthiest filthy sin in the whole world, Jesus' name is now attached to it. What's in that cup? The filth of all the world. So when you and I look at something inappropriate, when we steal, when we lie, and we cheat, when, we, when we're angry, when, whatever sins, whenever you and I sin, Jesus felt that. That was put on him because the Bible says he is now numbered among those who are the transgressors. Our Savior, our Christ, our Messiah, our Lord is now numbered and listed among the top ten most wanted, if you will. This is who he has become in the Father's eyes because he must become that. This is what the cup held. Secondly, the cup held the punishment of sin. Not only did this cup hold the filth of sin, but this sin had to be dealt with. That's been one of the most challenging things in, in being a father is knowing that your children have done something wrong and knowing that you have to deal with it. It's never easy. It's never easy to call out sin. It's never easy in my own, even my own life when somebody calls out sin. It's never easy in my own life when, when I've been made aware of sin in my own life. But here's the deal. Sin must be dealt with. Jesus Christ's name not, wasn't not only attached to that sin, but he knew he was the one that was going to pay the price for that sin. He knew he was the one that was not like, my name's not just attached to it. I have to be the one to pay the price for all those sins. When we were parenting, it was sort of popular, maybe it is now, uh, to try to look at you know, one child or two child and look at one and say, hey, now because you, you guys fought and you guys did this, this one is going to pay the price for both of what you did. And Never once did one of my children go, I'll gladly do that. I'll pay the price for the stupid things my sister did, right? I, I never, my parents, when I did that, my, my parents would look at me and say, well, Ron, you know, because of this, the, the method with there was to hopefully wake them up and sort of the one child would say, oh, no, no, no. But sometimes some children will look back and go, yep, you take the price, uh huh? Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off free. Jesus didn't have a free pass. The weight of all the sin of all the world was placed upon him. Because this sin had to be dealt with. What, was in, what is this cup that he's referring to? This cup held the punishment of sin. Listen to Romans chapter 8 and verse 32. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? But what do we learn here? He who did not spare his own son, gave him up, for us all. I'll be totally honest with you right now. I don't know that there's one person that I would sacrifice my children for. I don't know that there's one person out there that if they were to come and they were to say, Pastor Ron, in order for me to be relieved, in order for this to happen, would you give me one of your children so I could live my life free? I don't. The answer is probably no. Do you understand the price that God paid in sending His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of all of us? Why? Because this sin had to be dealt with. Listen to the, the, sort of the, the first part of Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. Speaking of God, Habakkuk says, You who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong." Why? Why did sin have to be dealt with? Because God can't look upon sin. And God desperately wants a relationship with you and I. So you're asking, well, that's awful cruel of a father to send his son to die. Actually, here's why he did that. 
Somebody had to die. And instead of you and I dying all the sin, for all the sins of all the world, and instead of you dying and being separated from God, God said, here's the final answer. I'll send my son as payment for the whole world. You and I become so familiar with that verse, we forget the filth and the pain and the price behind that verse that offered life to you and I. John 3, 16, for God so loved. Why do we have this idea that God is against us? Why do we have this idea that God's judgment is a negative? If it weren't for God's judgment of judging our sin, he would have no way to love us. And the reason why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, was judgment was going to fall upon him so that grace might fall upon you and I. Judgment fell on him so that you and I would receive grace, so that we might be restored. It was actually the father saying, I do not want to be separated from my children any longer. So here's the answer. He's going to take your penalty. He's going to take your filth. He's going to take your punishment. I'm going to send him to the cross. So when I look at you, I can look at you through him and know that he has paid the price. God had to turn his back on Jesus. And that, by the way, was the hell of all hells for Christ. The the crucifixion and the punishment and the torture was hell, yes. But what Jesus hated the most, if I can use that word, what he did not look forward to the most, the, the pressure that was on him, this press that was on him, was he knew that the Father was going to turn his back on him. And by the way, that is the hell of all hells, right? The hell of all hells isn't that, 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 that you and I are in, in, a, in a place of torment. It's that we can't be with our Father. That's what makes heaven heaven. What makes heaven heaven is not that we live for eternity and not that it's just blissful and light and we've got maybe angels' wings and we're floating around from cloud to cloud and live for eternity. What makes heaven heaven is for an eternity. We are with our Father in heaven. That's what makes heaven heaven, to be in a relationship with Him. Now, now get this. I, I want you to understand what happened here. What's in this cup? What happened? Jesus being eternal. Bore in a moment of time. Listen, Jesus being eternal. Bore in a moment of time. What you and I being infinite, a finite rather, right? Like we're we're temporal. We're limited to time and space. Jesus being eternal. He bore in a moment of time, the cross. What we being temporal would bear in an eternal amount of time. Jesus being eternal for a moment took on him the weight of sin that you and I being temporal who would only live for a moment, but without that we would bear the weight of that for eternity. That's literally what it means for Jesus to take our place. The eternal became temporal so that the temporal might be offered eternity. Think about that for just a moment. What was in this cup? The cup held the filth of sin. The cup held the punishment of sin. But I love this. Don't you love this word? It's one of the sweetest words in the whole Bible. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. Aren't you glad Jesus said that? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever spent a sleepless night wondering what to do? Have you ever wrestled with yourself? Have you ever wrestled in prayer? Have you ever wondered, is this my voice or God's voice or the devil's voice? Have you ever ever wondered, is this the right decision? Jesus was right there, but he didn't hesitate. He said, Lord, if it's possible, remove this cup. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he did not hesitate. He said, nevertheless, I'll take it. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will. Listen, here it is. In his humanity, he prayed with intensity. Remember, we're at Gethsemane, which literally means olive press. He's being pressed so much that he is now sweating drops of blood. In his humanity, he prayed with intensity. In his divinity, he prayed with obedience. He wrestled. He literally was sweating drops of blood. What does this tell us? This tell us, tells us that Jesus is the only man that did not have to die who chose to die. You need to get that. Jesus is the only man that did not have to die. He chose to die. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, listen, what does it say? And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that the judgment. It was never appointed for Jesus to die. 
He wasn't temporal. He's eternal. He's the, the eternal chose to become temporal so that he could die, so that he could offer the temporal, the eternal. Jesus is the only man that never had to die. He literally chose death so that you and I might have life. I said this last Sunday. Salvation is not learning lessons about the life of Christ. Salvation is receiving life from the death of Jesus Christ. And that's what this means. The eternal became temporal so that the temporal might not know eternity in Jesus Christ. Why? Why did he do this? Once again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For our sake, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, God's judgment on his son, listen, God's judgment on his son meant that you and I, who were sin, might be made righteous. How in the world can we look at a God who did that for us and say he's mean, he's vindictive, he's against me, he's, he's got it out, God's judging me, don't tell me how to live my life. He is the only God who for our sake made his own son sin so that you and I might be seen as righteous. Think about that for just a moment. This is why he did this. So what does that mean? It means you and I need to take this cup. You and I need to take this cup. Stop. Stop. Think about this for just a moment. Stop. Okay, hang on, right? You're hanging out at your house. You're sitting down in your couch. You're playing with Fido or something. The kids are running around. The beans are burning. I don't know what's going on right now, but stop. Go back just a few hours from the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is around a table. He symbolically takes a cup that they have no clue what that means. He symbolically takes a cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this cup, as often as you break this bread, remember, do this in remembrance of me. Listen, listen, listen. Before that cross ever happened, Jesus offered a covenant. Before the cross ever happened, Jesus was already offering an answer. Before you ever feel like you're judged, before you ever get to the point where you think God is against you, God has it out for you, God's not for you, God has already offered a way out. Before the cross had ever happened, he gave them the opportunity to enter into a covenant relationship. You don't have to go to the cross because Jesus has already made a covenant with the Father that you might be seen as righteousness. You don't have to nail yourself. You don't have to judge yourself. The best thing that could ever happen in your life is to realize that the judgment of God is the best thing for you because he is now seeing his son as the payment for your sins. Your sins, little... Take your sins right now and place them in a cup. Name them. Write them down. Visually pour them into that cup. That is the cup that Jesus Christ drank so that you might drink from a cup of covenant in his blood. You didn't have to drink that cup that he's, that he's drinking, the cup of sin. You have to drink the cup that he's offering, the cup of covenant. You and I must take this cup. Thanks be to God that he drank this cup. Because now we can drink the cup of the covenant that we talked about last Sunday. We drink the cup of communion because that's where we meet Jesus. We talked about that. Jesus' last words were, do this in remembrance of me. He didn't say, do this in ceremony of me. He didn't say, do this in salvation of me. He said, I want you to remember. Why? Why do I want you to remember? Because you're about to see something that you need to understand. I'm about to go to the cross and die for you, but I'm also about to come out of the tomb and come alive. So at that moment, when you run to the cross, remember that before the cross, there was a covenant that was ever established. God had a plan to restore you before Jesus ever went to the cross. The cross did not take Jesus by surprise. The cross was planned so that at the end of it, you and I would already have a covenant established with God. This is the cup that you and I need to take. That prayer in the garden moved heaven to earth. That prayer in the garden literally ushered in God's will. Because he was pressed, you and I now have the ability to come into the presence of God. But I want you to listen to these words. Listen to these words. You've got to catch this. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 38, 
Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful. Hang on. Let me read the verse and come back and explain it. Even to death, remain here and watch with me. This word sorrowful, it's almost difficult for us to describe. In the original language, the meaning of this word means without hope, left alone, isolated. At that moment, can you follow me back to here? At that moment, what Jesus was saying, no man can come with me. Nobody else can do this. Only I must pay this price. If right now in this season, you're overwhelmed with anxiety because of finances, because of uncertainty. If in this season of life, you're struggling with overwhelming issues. The reason why Jesus Christ took on this emotion of feeling helpless, hopeless, isolated. is So in that moment you would be able to say, I have a Savior who fully identifies with me. And I can come to Him. In this season, Jesus expressed, my soul is very sorrowful. Look at the rest of it. Luke chapter 22, verse 30, uh, 43 and 44 says, and an angel ministered to Him. Think about that for just a moment. The Son of God was so weak that he had to be ministered to through an angel sent by God. He was in such agony. He was in such agony that he had to come to that spot. The word sorrowful, it means separated, alone, with no hope or no way of escape. That's literally what that word means. Here it is. Jesus paid that way for you and me. Jesus paid that way. So what is our response to the Garden of Gethsemane prayer? It's overwhelming, to be honest with you. It's one of those things that I'm not really a dramatic person. I'm not really the type of person that walks into a, an area that's had a lot of conversation about it, and, and I feel like I, I have to respond. When I've gone to Israel, some people are like, oh, the Wailing Wall, but no, God calls them. When I've gone to Israel, the, the Sea of Galilee, not that big of a deal, and you just watch people weep in tears on the Sea of Galilee. When we go to the spot where, where Peter and Jesus had breakfast by the sea, it's, it, the emotions are overwhelming. The Garden of Gethsemane is one of those for me. I, I wouldn't consider myself to be an absolute prayer warrior, but when I go into the Garden of Gethsemane and, and there I am realizing exactly what Christ did for me at that moment, just hours I am, abs I am overwhelmed without words. I literally just walk around that garden without words. But I come out of that garden realizing that because he did this for me, I can now, because he drank of that cup, the filth of sin, the punishment of sin, because he drank of that cup, I can now drink of his cup, the new covenant in his name. Through his blood. I don't come out of that garden sorrowful. I come out of that garden thankful. In other words, you and I need to take that cup. What cup is that? Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What Jesus did that night at the Lord's Supper, what Jesus did that late night in the Garden of Gethsemane, was He pressed Himself to the will of the Father so that you and I might be able to enter into the presence of the Father. Jesus being eternal became temporal, so that the temporal might have a way to have an eternal relationship with the Father. What does this prayer tell us? How do, how do I even respond to this? The same way I still come out of that garden prayer. The same way I come out of that garden every time. Here it is. I need to, number one, submit to the Father. Jesus once again modeled for us what to do. 
which is why he asked the disciples, remain here and pray with me. I'm about to model for you how to respond. Number one, submit to the Father. This morning, listen, if, if, if you're at a place where maybe the circumstances we're living in have, have stripped away all that you have depended on, if you've been so dependent upon entertainment or job or income or, I mean, right, just, just the, the, the ability to run to the store has been disrupted. Just now gathering from 250 to 50 to 10, life has been massively disrupted. This kingdom that we, we thought was fairly solid has now been quickly shaken. Right now might be the best time. We're just one week away from Easter. Maybe to you Easter is, has meant it's the two times of the year you go to church. Maybe it's when as a dad you kind of show the family, yeah, I'll go to church with you guys. Maybe it's the only time of the year you buy something pastel and you dress up and right and you look good. But it might just be that the circumstances leading up to this Easter have left you felt hopeless, separated, and isolated. And this might just be the best time for you to submit to the Father, to come to Him. What does He tell us to do? Receive the payment receive the payment what does that mean to receive the payment recognize that what happened in the garden and what's about to happen on the cross was for you Jesus' own words on the night before he went to the garden of Gethsemane he said take this cup which is for listen please listen you take this cup which is for you can I just ask you right now to Social distance yourself even more and listen to me. Maybe now is the time that you submit to the Father. You receive the payment that Christ offered on the cross and said, God, I'm kind of thankful for the disruption in life because it's brought me to the place where my attention is on you. And I want to say, I thank you. I receive you. I come to you. I confess my sin to you. And today, for the first time ever, I receive your payment on the cross, your offer to come to you and have a relationship that me being temporal can receive the eternal today. And then how do you respond? You walk in life. You walk in life. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing so many awesome I guess they're called memes or gifts, right? I'm, I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Of, of these illustrations of, of folks coming into to rooms and they're just high-fiving, they're jumping and they're just hitting and slapping everywhere and people are saying, this is what it's going to be like when the church is finally told we can get back together that we're not just going to come in like, good morning. And we're not just going to worship like, it's okay. No, we are going to be so excited when we are gathered together. That's exactly how the church responded. They they weren't called the church. That's exactly how the church responded when they noticed the empty tomb. They ran. They shouted. They literally ran a distance from Jerusalem to Bethany. Miles. They ran miles to share the word. What do I do right now? Walk in life. Walk in life. One day this band will be lifted. One day you and I will be back together. But there's still a day that you and I are coming to Christ. May today be that day. Can we take just a moment and pray? Let me ask you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, it is my heart, it is my desire that, Lord, they understand this Garden of Gethsemane prayer. It's more than a pretty image of you praying on a rock. You literally, in agony and in sorrow, you separated and isolated yourself because you knew you were the only one that could pay the price. God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for paying the price for us. Thank you for giving us your life so that through your death we might have salvation. So, Father, I'm praying this morning, right now, somebody's listening, whether live or or later this week, I pray, Holy Spirit, use these words to bring somebody into a personal relationship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 